Okay. So we're broadcasting. Zero. There's no attendees so far. Okay. Fied. And, um, well, you know, we can just chat about how much we enjoy native gardening. Oh, sure. Yeah. And the one person, myself, that has not been able to do native gardening has figured out native gardening with potted plants like the thatch palm. They're super That's easy to grow in pots. And <laughs> let's see what else I have over here. I do my vegetable gardening too, but oh, I've nice. got dotted horse mint, twin flower. We actually have a species of basil that's native to like the very southern points of Florida that <laughs> we kind of, we got in at one point and no one ever was able to sell them. So I don't know if we got a rare batch of seed, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I, I managed to scrap a few and now I'm saving them and I have like native azaleas. Oh, um, very nice. I have some, whoops, I've got some peperomias behind me as well. Oh, I love, I love the fuzzy pepperoni. Yeah, they're so yeah. actually, check this guy out. I actually only potted him, like, a few, uh, a few, Oh wow! actually, maybe a few weeks ago, and it's grown incredibly. Oh, wow. Like, this has been the easiest growing thing, and it's, it's, it's excellent. I love these guys. Yeah, they're great plants. I oh. said, I was thinking of, um, the, um, Yeah. Pop right out of my head. We had um, we had a uh, oh uh, what a, what's it called? Um, it's another beach name. Um, not sage. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, Bruce planted it in a very tall pot, and it was beautiful um it filled out and then kind of cascaded downwards mm -hmm. and uh beach tea beach oh tea. beach tea yeah okay yeah and i thought that i i told him i said you should be selling this as a potted plant because it it works so beautifully it does that's that's actually you know i i've had mixed mixed kind of success stories with that one mm -hmm. um some people you know it kind of acts as an annual sometimes it does it does die out and you know it's one of those ones that's kind of crazy where it, it may die out in one area and then just pop up six feet yeah. you know over there so sometimes right. people don't really care for it that way but it's definitely a really really pretty plant um once it really fills out yeah and um the um uh the this um I'm just, I apparently I haven't had enough coffee today. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, I'm just trying to think of it's the um, shrub that we have in the garden that has done very, very well. And I remember Bruce saying specifically that that was one that is um, endangered in the wild and there was only one known native population left. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um... What could that have been? There's a few. There's a few in, in hmm. I feel like, I mean, so plants fitting that description tend to come out of like the Fakahatchee strand a lot, to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, actually, we just had a, uh, we just had a uh, conversation, I guess, Bruce, I don't know how he came into, into, you know, possession of the plant, but he got his hands on a, you know, an endangered species of peperomia at, Mm -hmm. act in the Fakahatchee strand mm -hmm. so we're trying to get all the legal work done uh you know and and get someone to propagate this on a on a fairly large scale so we can start promoting it and and getting people to plant this really endangered uh species is it the, is it the peperomia with the little leaves yeah yeah it's um we have oh like gosh. five or six in the garden oh really yeah oh they, fantastic uh, they ended up uh <laughs> I think they um, hitchhiked on one some of the other pots, and okay. so uh, we had their. Um, there's a couple right by where we have a lot of uh, rain lilies planted, um, alamasco, alamasco lilies, mm -hmm. and um, and then he had a patch where there was he had uh, native violets planted uh, for a while, and there was some fez fuzzy peperomia is what he called it and there was some of that growing there as well and they've been doing well and they're lovely little plants that's fantastic 
Yeah, I mean, it's stuff like that, you know, where, where these, it, it's really heartening, you know, these people go through such great lengths to find, to find those plants that really need to be found and propagated and, you know, sold mm-hmm. to people to, to kind of keep them alive because, you know, you know, the, the, the further we go down this, you know, path, uh, you know, the harder it gets to, to maintain the diversity that Florida has, which is very large. <laughs> I think yeah. I think we're one of the you know if if you know our ecosystems are some of the most diverse you know on the planet you know like even just pine flatwoods um, uh, are incredibly diverse yeah so yeah, yeah. well it's officially three thirty it is um, so I suppose we can get started and people can kind of trickle in. Yeah. Um, I guess, yeah. Um, Let me go ahead and... Yeah, maybe give them like five minutes and then... Yeah. Start. Yeah. Just a few more minutes. Oh, one of the other plants I've got down here is, um, have you heard of columbine? Our native columbines? Oh, I love columbine. I'm from Ohio originally and they're native to Ohio. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't know how it happened, but we, we, got, um, we got our hands on some seed of, of some of the North Florida populations and we started mm-hmm. propagating them. And oh. they're biennials, so you, know, yeah. you, only get a, you only get one bloom two years down the road and then it's, and then it's gone. Yeah. Um, but it's something that we kind of played around with as a pet project. But this year was the first year that the ones that we had bloomed. So we started propagation um, and are growing them out more. So hopefully that's something that we can get in, uh, in good propagation so that we can sell. Because columbine is a really, really, really pretty flower. And it's so unique, too. Yeah, it really is an incredible flower. In Ohio, the ones that we had were um, like a yellowish orange with like a an almost pink back um, back to it. And the the petals, or the, I guess it's the, the leaves that open up to the blossom um, mm-hmm. would have a pink tint to them. And um, I used to, we, we had like, a, I grew up on a farm, large farm in um, Northeast Ohio. And, and so I would just go out into the woods, which was like two thirds of our property, and then just bring the plants up to the house and plant them in shaded areas around the house just to um, have them have them around. But Columbine, man, the variety of colors that there are, I mean, they're just mm-hmm. really lovely and unique plants. Yeah, actually the first time, and I was really proud of it because I, I had just purchased a new phone kind of specifically for the, um, for the, for the camera. It was a really, really nice camera. And, um, you know, my biology class had just started field biology class. So I was really in the, in the mood to get, you know, different close up pictures and whatever I could do. And it just so happened that like the day after I brought that phone in, our Columbine started blooming. Um, mm-hmm. so I got the first couple pictures on this new phone were absolutely beautiful. I mean, so, some of the most proud pictures I've taken. For sure. yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> So the, um, uh, there were some of the other ones that um, how we had a lot of really neat native wildflowers like trillium and uh, Jacob's ladder and mm-hmm. um, uh, these things called May apples. They ain't to high heaven, but um, <laughs> they would once they matured enough, they would um, um, once they matured enough, they would bloom and produce one fruit, which was edible. And they were interesting looking plants. They looked like a, it almost looked like a, an umbrella and the flower and the, and then later on the fruit would then hang underneath it. And, um, and so um, my grandmother would always try and get me to go out and harvest them every time I saw them for May apple jelly. And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> They're really smelly plants. <laughs> I was like, I don't think I want the jelly. I don't care what you tell me. Yeah, I mean, it's stuff like that where I, 
I couldn't imagine going through the process of picking and processing and cooking that kind of stuff. Like if it smelled so bad, I, I couldn't imagine going through the whole process just to get something, you know, yeah. a product that was maybe just okay. I couldn't imagine eating something that smells that bad. Yeah. You know, it's worthwhile. It was one of those things where it's like, you know, in my, my farming family, it's like if it didn't move for 10 minutes, it got pickled. So um, <laughs> my grandmother was always adamant um, about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, well, did you want to go ahead and get started and we can just let everyone kind of trickle, trickle in? Sure. Um, let me... I can um, show my slide of the garden space. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so this is what the garden looks like at the Chihuly collection. Um, and this, um, you kind of see what it was intended for. Um, but um, uh, the Chihuly collection used to be located on Beach Drive and here in downtown St. Pete. And we uh, were offered the opportunity to move the Chihuly collection to its uh, current location on Central Avenue that is right across the street from the Maureen Art Center. Uh, the Maureen Arts Center actually owns the Chihuly Collection and all of its proceeds um, help to uh, financially support the community outreach and educational programming that the Maureen has been doing for the past hundred years. And um, when we uh, were in early discussions about the move, um, it uh, was very clear that um, one uh, avenue of revenue that had started to kind of see itself in our um, uh, stream was uh, re rentals of the Julie collection. And uh, so when we were looking at the new location, we really wanted to capitalize on that opportunity. And um, our new landlord um, was able to secure us this um, 4,000 square foot outdoor uh, patio space. And um, it was really pretty serendipitous um, how we got to the garden um, because uh, we were having the, um, you know, the typical uh, press conference with the, you know, uh, breaking ground uh, scenario. And uh, there was a benefactor that was there uh, that attended and uh, asked to chat with me. And... Uh, they wanted to remain, remain anonymous, but they offered to um, uh, cover the cost of putting in the landscaping, but their personal passion was native uh, planting, and uh, which coincidentally was exactly what I wanted um, for the garden space uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, prior to um, coming to run the Chihuly collection uh, six years ago. I used to work for Dale Chihuly in Seattle. And, um, you know, I had always had a passion for gardening and I loved um, native plants like I grew up with in Ohio. But, um, you know, I would say Seattle is just very well known for being very, um, so uh, you know, ecologically conscious. And so, uh, it made sense to me that given that context of the culture of uh, the Pacific Northwest and the connection to Dale, that we would do another native type of garden. And so she, uh, so we, we ended up um, working with Wilcox and, um, and this actually, this picture uh, was one of our first events that we had in the garden, not long after it was completed. And, um, and it was, it's become very um, successful for us in terms of generating that rental revenue. But um, it, it, the garden itself has been in, um, in a whole other way, 
uh, an interesting facet because we do get people that ask to come out and see the garden. Um, and we have a brochure that with a map that outlines uh, the species that are um, located throughout the garden. And then we added some types of programs throughout the year. And unfortunately, um, because of coronavirus, we couldn't host it this year, but uh, we did um, a family day ladybug release uh, every year uh, with um, families with small children. And we would give them the, the ladybugs and then they would be able to release them into the garden. And, uh, and you know, and it became talking points about uh, being more conscious about what, um, you know, what types of plants you have in your yard and uh, how that can affect uh, local populations of insects and other fauna. And so it, it was really a nice, interesting, added educational opportunity. Um, and uh, so it was um, something that, you know, we weren't really expecting um, so it's been a nice surprise. Um, but I would say, you know, the, um, uh, the garden itself has much more filled out than in this picture. Um, and, you know, uh, Bruce at Wilcox Nursery uh, used a very, um, uh, very saturated organic soil to replace all the soil in the ground. So um, everything is, I'll put it this way, everything is extremely happy where it's at. Um, we do have occasional times that um, Bruce will come in and trade out certain plants uh, for others um, just to kind of test the waters. We've had, we've seen varied success um, with things like uh, the um, uh, beach lavender or sea lavender, um, which works beautiful in a pot. Um, but uh, it also can be kind of top heavy. So it's, you know, it's a little bit of experimentation here and there. But the um, anchors, so to speak, would be the buccaneer palms and uh, key thatch palms and uh, horizontal cocoa plum and other things that have been incorporated into the garden. Um, also, we've seen um, some plants have done um, exceedingly well, like uh, uh, beach verbena, uh, has taken over large sections of the garden um, in lieu of uh, the ground covers like uh, the twin flower or uh, even sometimes the uh, creeping sage. And so it's been interesting, uh, more of an evolving garden rather than sticking to this, you know, sort of set design. And uh, it's been nice to see that. Um, but um, I guess I can hand this next portion off to you, Davis, about uh, why it's important to plant um, native species and what that means. And so I'm gonna stop sharing right here. Sure, and I will go ahead and start sharing. So uh, I'll uh, try not to bore people with, uh, with too many slides with too much text on it, but yeah, it was, it was really fortunate that we kind of came into contact and were able to um, put the project together with the Chihuly. Um, you know, we at the nursery do a lot of different, um, you know, residential and commercial properties, but to be able to kind of incorporate something um, native with the Chihuly or, you know, just any kind of popular area downtown is, is kind of uh, a feat in itself. So, you know, uh, just a quick kind of briefing for people who may not be as, um, you know, informed, um, you know, what native plants actually are. Um, so kind of by the textbook, uh, essentially it's a plant that has developed and adapted over hundreds of thousands of years in a particular region or ecosystem. So plants that have adapted to different types of climates that we can encounter um, and the things that have kind of evolved in tandem with uh, the wildlife to create um, sustaining ecosystems. And that's kind of the underlying uh, key word um, when you're talking about native plants is sustainability. You want plants that one will survive and thrive, um, but that will also promote different types of wildlife. You don't, you, know, you don't want them to just be pretty, although that's obviously a big factor when we're looking at landscaping, um, but definitely wanting to have something that will provide for wildlife, especially wildlife that may not have easy access to um, these plants normally. Um, 
So specifically in the United States, um, we define a native plant as, as a, a plant that had been established in a given area before European settlements, um, before the idea of bringing plants um, over from uh, Europe was kind of a thing. Um, so uh, again, function ecologically is the big thing. We want the sustainability um, to be present in these, um, in these plantings. Um, so uh, kind of like I said already, um, the native plants are the ones that have grown and adapted to their certain climates. And as such, we have different populations and different species of wildlife, different birds and pollinators and other kinds of animals that um, have grown and adapted to rely on those types of plants um, for either food or shelter or um, you know, any of the other um, types of support. Um, so that's kind of what we look to do um, with, with our native plantings. Um, you know, and, and we kind of mentioned the sense of place is one of the big reasons we want to include them because if you look maybe 2000 years ago, obviously you're gonna have very defined ecosystems um, where any you know, given point, uh, any, any given part of land is. So uh, a lot of times we try and mimic that in our landscapes. We do like to um, promote different types of plants that, um, you know, should be co-planted together based on ecosystem. And, you know, it's all about the sense of place. You know, you want to put the plants that have grown together and survived together because, you know, that gives you more sense of where you are um, in your ecosystem. Um, you know, I mentioned sustainability again, I probably will about 20 times through the, uh, the rest of the presentation, but that's really the big thing is that um, when we're looking at kind of what the, the, the meta has been um, with landscaping um, in recent years, it's been a lot of tropical. So we have um, a lot of different plants that are very colorful, um, what we call Florida friendly, um, basically plants that will grow and survive in, in you know, our, given, um, our given climates. Um, but they don't necessarily provide anything for wildlife. So, you know, it's kind of something that is, we're starting to transition away from, you know, in recent years, we're sort of, people are starting to trend in, into, in, in line with native plants, um, which is good. Um, and, um, you know, starting small, obviously, you know, there's a kind of a limit to what each of us can do, but even if we all kind of band together and started planting a few different native species in our yards, even that can have um, a really great impact on, um, on the yard and the, um, you know, the environment as a whole. So um, that's kind of the idea, uh, especially in, in partnering with the Chihuly is, you know, we wanted to show that one, we could um, do sort of a native planting, you know, these are plants that maybe not a lot of there has been this sort of meta of, of landscape planting. So when people look at it, they say, oh, well, that's, that's different. There's, they've got a lot of different textures and colors that I'm not used to seeing. Um, you know, so that's, that's one kind of uh, allure of, of the native plants, but also you look at how these things function ecologically, what they can sustain. Um, and uh, I know I can pass this off to Andy because he's had a lot of, um, really good success stories with what has been invited into this space since we planted it. But um, I wanted to keep the, uh, the slide up here that shows you uh, some of the areas, um, I wanna say maybe a year ago, um, uh, or maybe a little bit longer after they've been planted. So, Andy. Yeah, um, so what you're looking at the pictures, uh, close up pictures of the garden here, the, the top left one is, this would have been probably not too long after it was originally planted. Um, but then the other pictures show more progress at, uh, over the years. Um, some uh, interesting um, points, you know, obviously um, a good one is pictured both uh, in the upper left-hand picture and then in the lower center and is the marlberry tree. Um, and that uh, plant in and of itself uh, produces uh, dark uh, purple uh, fruits, small fruit, which um, attract quite a few birds to the garden. Um, so those get uh, picked clean, you know, pretty pretty quickly um, in the garden every year. And, um, and then in the uh, lower left, uh, you're seeing a really neat area of some uh, twin flower brown cover, fakahatchee grass, uh, some horizontal cocoa plum, uh, key thatch palm, 
And what you can't see right next to it, it behind the Keith Hatch palm is some native coffee and, uh, and then some dwarf Fakahatchee grass. And then, um, which we've seen a lot of um, attraction of uh, specifically native bee population coming to the uh, native coffee plants, which is, you know, all of us that are um, ecologically minded um, know that that is a huge benefit right now for native bee populations to have things. Um, honestly, it's really interesting to me um, how many we attract uh, because I'm not too far away from Mirror Lake Park. I'm only like two blocks, but I don't see nearly quite the attraction of, of uh, insects when I walk by it uh, going back and forth to work. Um, another um, one that's been nice to have is in the lower right, the shrub in the lower right is the snowberry. And it has uh, completely filled out into almost like a, a hedge, uh, so to speak, and uh, produces beautiful, beautiful white berries. Um, but um, I actually have um, some additional slides that I can show of, of to kind of talk about the what we've seen happen. And um, the, let's see here. Pull up mine again real quick. And so uh, one of the plants that we saw um, that was planted directly uh, because it, or it was planted specifically because it would attract um, butterflies and uh, it's called Bahama Cassia. And we, it, it's, become a large, large shrub. And every year around February to about now um, is just studded with yellow blossoms. And um, for being in the middle of uh, the city and having, you know, you know, 10 foot walls all the way around, um, it was pretty fascinating to see how many butterflies were attracted to the garden um, because uh, over the every every year we see I mean dozens upon dozens of caterpillars um, all over our uh, cassia plant and uh, and then they they're eating the flowers uh, which gives them their beautiful yellow tone when they turn into butterflies um, and it's been really interesting to see just how many have have come off that plant and so um, it's every year we're constantly uh, seeing this uh, uh, influx of the butterflies. And then this is a picture of the uh, Aplidium, oh, I misspelled it. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, Psychotria nervosa, uh, the native coffee plant that attracts the bees uh, to those small white flowers. And we'll get um, hundreds of bees. Uh, and, and it blooms pretty regularly um, that it really, and they have, it has a long, it seems to have like a long period of time that it blooms. Um, so, you know, that's been really enjoyable to see as well. And um, then this one was actually a surprise to me because I didn't know too much about the, <laughs> our native lizards. And um, I remember remarking to uh, Bruce Turley from Wilcox, I said, hey, you know, weirdest thing, I, I've seen these uh, green anoles um, in the garden. And he was like, really, that's great news uh, because those are the native ones. And, and I said, really? And he told me that the brown ones that we most commonly see uh, as Floridians um, is uh, an invasive species from Cuba. And they like the same things, um, both species. And so they are in uh, tough competition with each other. And um, I ended up doing a little bit more research on our native species, the Carolina uh, anole, and found a study that uh, in looking to be able to compete with the uh, Cuban species, that uh, scientists were able to observe um, that it, within as little as uh, 20 generations that 
our native species adapted larger toe pads that allowed them to climb higher into shrubs and trees, thereby eliminating the competition that they would have on the ground with um, the Cuban species. And why I point this out is it, that that picture that uh, Davis had of where the thatch palm and the coffee and the, where the snowberry is and stuff like that, um, it kind of created that, that underbrush effect that you might get in a wild uh, situation you know, in, in the woods. And, and it seems to have attracted a number of them. Uh, we started with one, but I want to say, you know, there might be a half dozen of them. Sure, we still have the Cuban species on the ground, but um, the uh, Carolina uh, enoles have been really, really attracted to uh, the garden, which was fantastic to see. Um, and just for, you know, the, the sake of, you know, if people wanted to look it up, I included the original uh, article and uh, it was interesting for, you know, because of how fast they were able to evolve, um, what the um, study provided in as few as 15 years, basically, um, when they uh, first uh, began the study. And um, so, you know, again, thinking about in terms of your gardens at home, what your gardens can provide, uh, sometimes just unknowingly that you, you may have already created that environment that would be perfect for native species that um, may not have as easy of a time with uh, other non-native non species because they're just, not, it's not a plant that they've evolved with. Um, so um, that was, I thought that would be interesting for people to see and um, and go back to uh, go back to that, but um, um, it's been a, because we we planted some of the plants for in order to attract butterflies specifically um, in the garden, and we um, did plan for some of that. But um, some of the offset, like the bees and um, the uh, lizards that we're experiencing, um, were kind of uh, a pleasant surprise in the Chihuly Native Garden. And, you know, having um, an, a garden in, in an urban landscape like we do, um, I, they're really, you know, you saw the pictures of the garden. While it's 4,000 square foot, you see it's mostly concrete. And the, so the landscaping has a tremendous impact in spite of it not being the entire space. So if you can imagine if we had more room and we filled that with um, even more native species, um, what kind of uh, additional impact that it would have for native fauna. And, um, and I really try and tell our guests that you know, are interested in it to really think about that kind of stuff um, because, you know, one, the best thing about, for me, about planting native plants in any garden is that they've spent thousands and millions of years um, evolving to live right here. So they're not going to be high maintenance. <laughs> um, and two, that uh, there are so many animals and insects that also evolve to depend upon them. And so it's, it, in retrospect, it's only natural that I should have expected to see um, all of these additional delightful creatures coming into the garden every day. And, um, and it's it, creating that kind of network, um, you really do, you know, come back to that idea of sustainability and, um, and what it means for native populations. Um, so I, yeah, I, I just think there's, there's, there's no bad way about it. And, um, and then not being a native Floridian, um, coming up from Northeast Ohio and then living in the Pacific Northwest, I had no idea what to expect when it came to native plants. Um, and, you know, I often described it, you know, when I first moved here, I was like, everybody plants their house plants in the yard now. And because uh, virtually everything I see has always been a house plant in Ohio. Um, but uh, what I've seen is that um, there's so much tremendous variety 
in the plants that we have native to Florida. And there are some just incredible examples and beautiful, beautiful plants um, that are really relatively easy to take care of. And um, just, you know, the, the salvia, the um, native salvia here is gorgeous. And, and you have to, it's like growing mint for those of you who've ever grown mint, you know, you can't get rid of it after a while. But um, the, um, uh, the other plants that, uh, you know, it's, we've had some interesting success with too, uh, were ones that were uh, actually uh, are in endangered populations. And uh, Davis and I were talking a little bit about this before we started. And um, uh, we have a few examples of um, uh, uh, the dwarf salt bush, for instance, um, which has been doing very well in our garden. Um, and uh, from what I understand, uh, there's only one native population left. Uh, there were two, but uh, Hurricane Hermine uh, wiped out one of them. And, um, and then we also have what's called spirit grass uh, planted in the garden, which is only native to two counties in all of the United States. Um, and, and it's beautiful. Uh, I think it's a fantastic, it's a, um, it's a wide leaf grass that you wouldn't even think to call it grass when you look at it. Um, but it's uh, a beautiful ground cover uh, in the garden space. And then uh, um, we have uh, what is called fuzzy peperomia. Um, and they're these delightful little plants that have beautiful, beautiful uh, foliage year round and uh, very waxy um, dark green leaves. And, um, and, and that one is, is highly endangered. Oh yeah, that's right. I, I do, yeah, I was just gonna say, if I, if I can cut away um, me not having a yard to plant in, I do actually have the fuzzy peperomia planted in this beautiful hand-painted pot. Um, but yeah, it's, it's got the, it grows in a very uh, ham, you know, hammock style uh, of a environment. Um, so shade. Uh, oh, you're cutting out. You're cutting out. I can't hear you. There we go. Does that sound better? Yep. yep. Okay, better. perfect. Well, anyways, uh, every, I think hopefully everyone got to see the uh, the plant. But yeah, it's it's one of those that, um, you know, it's, it's very, even in the native plant community, can be very... Um, you know, could be not well known because of, you know, the kind of um, obscurity of it, you know, when we look at the endangered and the threatened species. Um, one, you know, because they're the types of plants that you don't see very often. Um, and, you know, uh, because, um, you know, in on the nursery and production side, they're the plants that are kind of the hardest to obtain uh, legally. There's kind of a whole uh, set of hoops you have to jump through, especially for threatened and endangered species to be able to um, and start propagating the plants. So um, especially like that, we love to introduce those, even if they're not in the, their native environments, um, at least being able to preserve them um, because uh, their status is so kind of volatile. Um, I was gonna say that, um looks like we have some questions mm -hmm. and actually um if you don't mind uh holly had this question um a little bit ago and it kind of ties into the next part uh the next little point i was gonna uh, address um so i will go ahead and try my answer live uh section here okay and uh let me share my screen um Um, so, yeah, um, she had a couple of questions. Um, I guess I will go ahead and read it. Um, oh, goodness. Like, there we go. Um, so she says, I have a home in clear water. The soil is very poor. Um, I'm composting. What plants do you suggest to use? Um, uh, do I use to landscape? Uh, economical, attractive, uh, food, um, It'll take a while to create good soil. So um, that kind of ties into my where to start um, uh, topic. So 
it can be a little daunting. Um, you know, I've been, I've been in the native plant business for, for a while and definitely from my start to where I am now, there's, there's definitely a lot of information uh, to, to understand. Um, we do have some of, uh, we were talking about this before, but we do have some of the most diverse uh, ecosystems in the world, especially things like the longleaf, um, the longleaf pine forests. And um, so there can be a lot to chew on uh, when you're looking at putting something in your backyard. So kind of how I like to break it down for people is you can always start by looking at what you already have. Um, you know, you can look at the different types of plants that are in your yard currently. If you have any sorts of trees, shrubs, or ground covers, you can kind of um, build on that. Um, you can look at things like a pine tree and say, um, well, I have a pine tree that's growing naturally. Um, you know, this area must be very well suited for a pine tree. So you can look at things, um, companion plants for things like the pine tree. So you could look at the pine flatwoods ecosystem. You could look at things like uh, saw palmettos and beauty berries um, and different types of low growing grasses um, as ground covers kind of for inspiration. Because obviously when you design your yard, you do want it to look pretty. You do want kind of a balance between um, the aesthetic of it and also the impact um, ecologically. So I usually like to start there. Say if you have anything, you can start kind of creating your yard based on that palette. Um, you know, and um, you can always, there's plenty of resources. Um, obviously, Wilcox uh, is, is certainly one. Um, but every county in the state has a local um, University of Florida um, IFAS extension. That's a great source of information, too, to get started. Um, there's plenty of native nurseries that are out there, especially in Florida, um, that you can go and research um, what they have to say as well. Um, but anyone that's designing a yard, you always have to have a goal in mind. Um, you know, what types of areas do you want to frame um, for the house? What different kinds of colors are you trying to go for, contrasts? Um, but when you incorporate native gardening, you want to also ask, um, you know, what kind of life are you trying to support? Um, you know, what kinds of animals um, you're trying to bring in, pollinators, birds, um, things like that. So you can kind of tailor, um, you know, your yard to what you're trying to achieve in, in kind of both aspects. You know, we've got plenty of, um, plenty of different plants, like, um, like Andy had mentioned, the coffees are fantastic because um, they can be low growing shrubs uh, that will provide the flowering and the fruiting uh, and great, great attractors for pollinators, but you can also um, let them grow taller. You can let them envelop more space um, and they'll give you, you know, your, your white colors uh, and reds with the, with the flowering and the fruiting, um, you know, and because we are, we have such diversity in our native species, you know, and, you know, a good amount of them are available out there um, to, you know, to residentials and, and for commercials. Um, you know, you do have a lot to choose from, you know, it may be kind of daunting when you first look at it and say, oh my God, we've got a thousand species that I need to, to look at. There's so much, there's so many choices. It's kind of like, you know, going to the cheesecake factory and not being able to order after an hour. Um, but, you know, that, that kind of comes with learning about what you want to achieve and then kind of parsing through the different plants um, to find the things that you, that you really want to do. Um, you know, and I always say experiment, try new things, see what works and what doesn't. You know, uh, the the climate and the um, and the uh, the different uh, environments that we have are very are, are extremely variable. You know, uh, in Florida we measure elevation in inches, so we have certain ecosystems that can live and thrive at you know uh, a few inches above uh, sea level, but then maybe a couple inches more, you have a completely different ecosystem um, be just because of those few inches. Um, so. There is a lot to chew on, but um, you know, as more and more people start getting into the native gardening and, and using these plants in their yards, um, you know, it kind of becomes easier for people that maybe haven't started um, to see what they can do, you know, what their options are. Um, you know, there's always certain types of plants that we promote because they're kind of our bread and butters. Um, you know, plants that you know do extremely well um, in a, a number of different conditions. Um, and also, um, you know, plants that are very, uh, you know, pleasing outright to, to a wide number of people. Um, so uh, for, uh, for uh, Holly, I would say, you know, there's a few different plants that you can try out. It all depends on what kinds of areas you're trying to plant um, and what kinds of colors you're looking for, textures. 
um, you know, what kind of wildlife you're trying to introduce. You know, you can look at things like the marlberry and the coffee um, and even some of the palmettos if you're looking to invite birds or, um, you know, kind of larger um, mammals. But if you're looking for pollinators, then you can start to look into like our um, native wildflowers. Even some of the shrubs are, are good attractors for those. Um, you know, and just kind of play around with it. There's, there's a lot to choose from. So it's something that can be, you know, a little intimidating to get into at first, but we do have so much available um, that it really does allow for a lot of freedom once you, um, you know, once you do uh, start to see what's out there. So. All right. Um, it looks like we got another question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Do you have any suggestions on how to plant native in pots? <laughs> you have a yard to garden in. I think hmm. David is a perfect example. So, uh, yeah, um, I'll tilt my camera down here. So obviously I live in an apartment, so I don't have that space to garden in. Um, so what I would say, and I guess I had omitted uh, in that last answer is that um, because Florida soils generally are very poor, um, a lot of the plants that we would look to plant have adapted to that. So a lot of these different types of species, you don't necessarily need to look into amending your soil. In fact, sometimes it could be detrimental. Um, you know, a lot of our plants have adapted for very dry, poor soil um, that water and nutrients leach out of very readily. Um, so they look for that really dry soil. They've adapted, um, you know, they've adapted to that scenario. Um, and to the extreme, if you amend your soil, um, it holds a lot of moisture and a lot of nutrient. Sometimes that can start damaging the plant. Um, so I would say, again, you just need to know your plant. Um, I can say generally, um, a lot of the plants don't require um, any amendments to the soil. Um, but uh, in the case of container gardening, um, you know, I do have kind of a mix of herbs, um, herbs, vegetables, and actual native species in the pots. Um, you know, and the natives, unless it is a, a certain type of species that demands um, a richer soil, more moisture, more nutrient. Um, I usually do uh, a potting mix that um, is uh, very aerated, doesn't hold too much moisture, um, and drains out fairly quickly. Um, so I do have plants like uh, our twin flower that we had planted over at the Chihuly in a pot over here. Um, I do have some dotted horse mints. Uh, I do have a native azalea, which is one of those types of plants that does grow in very shaded um, hammocky type uh, environments. It does like more moisture. Um, so I've kind of, uh, you know, uh, amended for that. So it does have a, a mixture that will contain more moisture. Um, and I do have a few others that I'm kind of experimenting with. I do have the peperomias, which, uh, you know, it's a shameless plug, but they are absolutely the easiest plants, the easiest native plants to care for. That's my uh, fuzzy peperomia. And then back here is um, uh, a different species of peperomia. It's a wide leaf peperomia. Um, so in container gardening, you know, I would say just know what type of environment your plant likes, especially if it's native. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the plants on the patio here, because I'm surrounded by oak trees, um, do tolerate a shadier environment. Um, I am playing around with uh, a few plants that do like more sun, so we'll see how it goes. But things like palms, uh, the peperomias, the azalea, um, and even the twin flower, those are plants that uh, definitely um, can thrive in that kind of lower light scenario. Um, and then just keeping them watered. Um, the only other tip I would give for um, container gardening uh, with native plants is a lot of the plants that we do have and that we do promote uh, at the nursery um, tend to get a lot bigger um, than is kind of manageable in pots sometimes. Um, so it is a little bit of a different beast where you have to look at pruning a little bit to keep it manageable. Um, you know, you're confining them to a certain size um, for their roots to grow into. So you may need to look at root pruning um, if they start to, you know, twirl around uh, their roots. It's kind of constricting. Um, we would just up, uh, take the plant out of the pot, cut a uh, part of the root ball, and then um, replant it in some soil to let it regrow. Um, but it's fairly manageable as long as as long as the plants that you choose can tolerate those um, you know scenarios that you're putting them in. Um, it's it's very doable, for sure. Yeah, and we and uh, I don't know if anybody noticed too that in the. Um, first picture that I showed of the to the collection garden um, there are some uh, it, it's not just um, 
plants in the soil, we do have a lot of potted plants um, that have had, we've had varied success with over the years and, and have traded some out um, that have had better tolerance than others. But um, uh, uh, the Scarlet Salvia um, does great in the pot uh, as long as you keep it watered and and it's beautiful um, I think to answer another one of um, Holly Haggerty's questions is that um, uh, the native salvias to Florida are uh, brilliantly colored and very very easy to grow and um, and and they've uh, we've transitioned to having it in in the uh, soil with the rest of the um, the rest of the plants but then um, I think we also have um, uh, not maybe a dwarf fire bush. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, compact. Uh, we don't we don't usually like to call it dwarf um, because there is a uh, a dwarf variety of um, what we call the Mexican um, mm -hmm. fire bush. It's a different population, mm -hmm. um, so not one that you'll find out in the wild in Florida. Um, but there is a uh, cultivar that's been bred um, from native stock that is that we call compact. It, it's okay. still. Um, doesn't get nearly as tall as the regular fire bush, but can put on maybe about six feet or so. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful plant, bright, bright colors, beautiful flowers, and then, um, and yeah, I mean, there's, um, those are, those are some really good examples, and um, uh, and then um, I want to say uh, some of the other ones that worked in that uh, we've had. Um, Black-eyed Susans, um, which are just a lovely plant anyways, and that's another very easy to grow um, coneflower, um, another very easy to grow native plant, um, uh, beautiful blossoms. The uh, Rosenflower, uh, it was, um, came to the Chihuly Collection Garden as uh, it hijacked the Fakahatchee grass. <laughs> And uh, so all of a sudden out of the middle of this giant, beautiful uh, Fakahatchee grass plant is these uh, stems of uh, the Rosenflower that I really like them. Um, and, but I don't know if I'd recommend it for a pot because our soil is got a lot of humus in it more than you would probably find normally. So the Rosenflower, I'm 6'3", and I had to look up to look at the top flowers. So that gives you any indication about how good our you know, uh, composted soil works for local plants. Um, but, um, but yeah, uh, there, there's, uh, the plants, the, the pots actually give a really nice, beautiful, you know, display and, and uh, kind of architecture to the to the landscape garden. So there might be some options there. Um, so uh, to uh, I'll answer uh, Holly's other question too. If you're looking for stuff like, um, you know, uh, some of the smaller birds, blue jays, um, cardinals, uh, you know, even some of the um, you know songbirds, um, you look for stuff that will provide. Um, will provide, uh, you know, berries. So we look at stuff like um, beauty berry is a fantastic example. Um, our beauty berries um, are larger growing shrubs, um, you know, at maturity, they can grow up fairly tall, um, you know, six, eight feet, um, maybe even taller than that. Um, but what they do is they'll flower in the springtime with these clusters of pink flowers along the stems. And, you know, they're very pretty, very ornamental, um, very clean looking shrub. And um, later on into the summer, uh, they will go ahead and close up those clusters and provide these bright purple berries. Um, and their kind of aesthetic is that they will then allow the, um, allow the branches to weep, give this kind of circular effect. Um, but they are one of the, uh, you know, like berry feeding powerhouses. They bloom so much and they also produce so much that it's kind of a one-stop shop plant, um, to invite the pollinators and the, um, and uh, a lot of these, um, berry eating birds. Um, so that's something I would recommend. Um, Simpson Stopper is another one. Um, it's a larger growing shrub, uh, has these very fragrant white flowers, um, but also produces these reddish uh, yellow berries uh, later on into the summer. So we do have, um, again, there's, there's a huge diversity. So you could plant quite a number of these, um, you know, depending on the size of them, you could space them out let them be, um, you know, kind of uh, centerpieces for certain areas, plant them, you know, in numbers so that you can get kind of a, a maybe a hedge-like effect. 
Um, but stuff like the beauty berries, the Simpson stoppers, um, we've got the, um, we've got the snowberry over at the Chihuly. That's a fantastic plant. A little bit bigger the berries are. So, you know, uh, the, the species might vary. Um, but, you know, things like that. And for birds, you also want to look at um, different types of uh, shrubs or larger growing trees um, that can also provide the cover um, for birds. Um, nesting habitat. Um, things like the wax myrtle are larger growing shrubs or trees that can grow maybe like 20 feet tall. Um, you know, uh, at a certain point, they can grow much larger, um, but they grow so dense um, that they provide quite a bit of uh, cover. And if you have female, because they are male and female plants, the, the wax myrtles, um, they could also potentially provide food with their, with their berries. So kind of having a mix of both um, you know, uh, food providing plants, but also um, habitat providing plants. Um, you know, you want to have kind of an all encompassing, um, you know, uh, environment for the types of wildlife you're trying to bring in. Um, you know, uh, everyone knows that, uh, you know, milkweed will uh, invite monarchs, but you also want to give them things to nectar on, especially if your milkweeds are getting eaten down to the ground every single week and those plants aren't able to go and bloom. You want to pair them with other plants that'll be there. Um, to provide the nectar source for those butterflies so they can kind of keep the cycle going. Uh, can people eat the beauty berries? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and take this one too. So um, over the years, um, me and one of my other employees, um, Hillary, we have been working on um, uh, we've been doing presentations and also doing a lot of our own research and testing on different types of native plants that you could um, eat with, use, you know, culinarily. So beautyberry is definitely one that you can eat. Um, out of hand, the berries don't taste like much. Um, they're kind of floral almost. Um, so what we've done is made different types of jams with them. Um, they do produce a lot, so it's very easy to collect enough to do something with. Um, simply just putting them in a pan, covering with water, simmering them. Um, and then adding uh, you know, uh, crazy amounts of sugar, uh, <laughs> and then uh, and then a little bit of um, you know gelatin or, or you know uh, jam, uh, you know substance to kind of clean it up and tighten it up. Um, it makes a fantastic jam. And when you do add that sugar and when you cook it down, um, it makes a really sweet, really floral um, type of berry that really is you know kind of like nothing you've ever had um, before. Um, mm -hmm. So, and that is one thing I guess maybe I'll go on a little bit of a tangent on um, is that, um, you know, we do have a lot of customers that are interested in permaculture as well. They want to know what they could plant so that they can eat it. And, um, you know, I will always talk to them about the native plants that you can eat or that you can harvest from. Um, but using them as companion plants is definitely something that's important because when you're planting fruit trees or vegetables or herbs, you definitely want to be looking for the beneficial insects, um, animals like uh, different types of birds that can keep, um, you know, very common pests away because they're looking to eat them. Um, but they'll also, when they bring in um, all of these different types of wildlife, you're also promoting um, your fruit trees or your vegetables to get pollinated so that they can produce. Um, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand is that you could always eat them, but they'll also promote um, the kinds of activity that you want to have a successful, um, uh, you know, other successful aspects to your, um, to your garden. Um, and I would just pop in here and say, when I, when we're talking about the native coffee plants that we have in the Chihuly Collection Garden, it is not the kind of coffee plant that you want to make coffee with. And I will stress that <laughs> there's, uh, it is not, it is not for human consumption. Um, so those are, those types of coffees grow in places like Ethiopia and, you know, other countries where they originated. Um, so yeah, I, uh, that was my first question because I'm a big coffee drinker. I was like, really, could I? And he's like, you won't like what happens. So that's, that's true. I have heard accounts that, um, that it can induce minor hallucin, uh, hallucinations. Oh, so, um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. Um. And that is one disclaimer that we always include with our presentations or whenever we give this type of information is please be exact, you know, absolutely sure, consult the right experts that will tell you whether or not these plants uh, can be harmful to you or to other animals. Um, yeah. You know, if you've got dogs or cats or, or what have you. Um, um, 
But I will say, uh, Andy, uh, since you're uh, very interested in, uh, in your caffeine, uh, we do have the uh, Yopon Holly uh, native to Florida. It's a very, very um, uh, profuse plant, especially in this area, in Pinellas. Um, but it's a, uh, a relative of the, uh, the yerba mate plant. Oh, um, it's, a, it's a type of holly, um, the yerba mate is. Um, and so uh, what you can do, it's a very small leafed holly, um, you know, promotes uh, birds just like any of the other hollies. They produce very small yeah. berries. Yeah. Um, but what you can do is you can take these uh, mature leaves, the dark green leaves, just pick them off and put them on a baking sheet and throw them in the oven, uh, mm -hmm. you know, 350 for 12 minutes. And these things, um, the Yopon holly is actually the only caffeinated plant uh, native to North America. So, oh, wow. <laughs> so you can look at creating your own Yopon tea if this is a plant that you've just got in your backyard. Um, and it tastes, it's, it's, it's just a black tea if you roast your leaves. Um, it tastes fantastic, um, you know, without any sweeteners. But, you know, we're down south, so maybe people like to put some sugar in there. Um, but it, it makes a fantastic plant. So there, there is a lot that you can do um, with adding these natives in your yard. You're not only promoting, um, you know, the different types of wonderful wildlife um, into your yard, but you may also have a few that uh, you can get some benefit uh, out of as well. Sounds good to me. I might have to look into that. <laughs> Ilex vomitoria is the uh, is the botanical name for that plant. And <laughs> I guess since I always love telling my story, the Latin name came about because the indigenous people um, used to use that plant. Um, they would brew such concentrated um, mm -hmm. doses of this stuff that what they would do is use it as a test of strength or manliness is that they would brew this you know syrup essentially and drink it and the people that could keep it down the longest without vomiting hence vomitoria uh would be deemed the strongest of the of the tribe and uh wow. you know so <laughs> it's some fun history on that one but it's yeah. definitely safe to consume in regular uh proportions that you just <laughs> brew a normal tea bag with but yeah nice um so yeah uh let's see if we have any more questions here um, doesn't look like it. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I guess maybe we'll, uh, Andy, if you have anything else to say. Um, no, I think, um, I think, you know, kind of rounding it up on my side is, um, yeah, I just, you know, as somebody who's, um, just experiencing this, you know, um, sort of because of my work situation at the Chula collection, um, you know, it's been really rewarding on a number of levels. So, you know, I would really highly recommend to plant uh, native plants because again, I was shocked at the variety and beauty. Um, you know, you, you always think of things like, you know, irises and tulips and stuff like that, that, you know, are just commonplace plants that don't do well here. Um, and yet here, like the the salvia is incredible. The um, the I love the the twin flowers. Beautiful ground cover, uh, really spectacular ground cover, um, and stuff like that. That is that is native here. So not only are you planting something that was made to be here, but you're also um, it, it, they're incredibly beautiful and elegant plants. So um, you know there, there's no. There's no downside to any of this for me, um, and being mindful of that, and and it, you know having the sort of um, um, almost you know micro ecosystem that's been created in the Chihuly Collection Native Garden, um, it, it's been really uh, an exciting and fun watch. Uh, Dorothy Tony raises hand. Sure. All right, I think we let you, uh, I think you have to go ahead and actually I can unmute you, I think. Hey, Dorothy. Can, hello, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Great. Here we go. Do you have a question for us? Uh, is it, it's probably not possible right now to see the garden, I would assume, am I right? Right. Unfortunately, the, the Chihuly collection is closed to the public um, uh, until we know it's safe to open back up. Right. Yeah. Because it's, uh, I, Aaron, oh, I know what I wanted to ask you. Are things labeled in the garden? Yes. 
Uh, we have um, the traditional uh, plant labels like you might see at a botanical garden on virtually all of the plants. Oh, great. Yeah, I'm from uh, originally Connecticut and Massachusetts. So, uh, and we're going to be purchasing something right now. We're, we're staying, staying temporary here, but we're going to be moving in somewhere permanently. And I'd like to put, I always had huge gardens up there and I'd like to put some gardens in, but I would like to have plants that grow here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it, you know, just um, you know, uh, email me at the uh, Truly Collection or anything like that. I'd be happy to show you the garden. Um, and uh, and like I said, you know, like you know, we have you know whole irrigation system and everything like that, so it's constantly being cared for. But I wouldn't say anything that is in our garden seems very high maintenance and actually has been doing extremely well given it, uh, its location. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm anxious to learn about a, a, a gardening in a totally different climate mm -hmm. uh, than uh, New England. Wintry, cold, wet, snowy right now, New England. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. My daughter called me almost, literally crying. She's in the house, you know, five weeks, whatever it is, six weeks with three kids and her husband and uh, working from home. And it, it her uh, forecast the other day with the the, this was last Thursday for the, the upcoming nine days, five of them had snow. <laughs> wow. she, she just, she, she's right over the line from us, basically in Massachusetts and New York State. And she just, she literally, she said, that's it. I have to tell you, I'm actually finally crying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel yeah. so bad. <laughs> <laughs> then so I get hour by hour pictures out her out her onto her deck <laughs> with, with a ruler mind you to, to let me know and meanwhile I'm telling her well it's it's really hot here it's 89 you know mm -hmm. and on and on she's I just can't hear it mom please don't do that to me anymore <laughs> <laughs> well so, welcome to Florida yeah welcome to Florida I mean yeah, you know right. We have we have such um, you know diverse uh, you know we have we have such diverse uh, you know ecosystems in our state and and like I said they're they're so variable that you know even a few degrees uh, could mean the difference uh, you know uh, for you know something growing uh, in South Florida and something not making it uh, you know even just a little bit uh, further north so you know uh, like I say always you know it's something that. Um, it's something that, you know, we need to, uh, you know, there's a lot of information to, to take in about the native plants, but it's always, you know, starts with, you know, looking at what you guys, um, you know, like, what you want to achieve in your yard, um, you know, the different types of wildlife you want to promote, different colors, different textures, and, you know, there is such a great, um, you know, expanse of native plants, especially what's available. Um, you know, that, that you could really, you know, dig in, see what, you know, see what you can come up with. And there's always going to be different types of, um, you know, there's always going to be different types of, um, you know, resources for you to use, um, either, you know, local, you know, native nurseries, um, you know, like Wilcox or Sweet Bay Nursery down south uh, in Sarasota, or, um, you know, we've got plenty of them um, all over the state. Um, but also, you know, the local, uh, the local IFAS uh, extensions are great resources, um, especially if you're just starting, um, you know, to understand uh, more and kind of how to dip your, uh, how to dip your toe in the, in the native, um, you know, landscape, uh, in the native landscape scene. Yeah, I hadn't thought of the extension service, those, use those in, in Connecticut in particular, uh, but hopefully things will be changing soon. So we can be using all sorts of facilities like that and coming into that garden to see that you're the one you have there. It sounds lovely. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, um, I had um, answered a question from Amy. Um, so if uh, you guys have access to that answer, um, that's the link for the um, just the homepage for um, the University of Florida site um, for the Pinellas extension. So there's plenty of resources on there specifically about different types of plants um, that you could go and research, um, you know, obviously on our website, Wilcox Nursery, um, we've got a big catalog of um, the different species that we sell. So that might be a good jumping off point. 
Um, but also, you know, looking around, talking to your neighbors, your friends, um, especially if you see someone with a kind of different looking yard, uh, you know, or if you went to the Chihuly, that'd be a fantastic place to start. Um, because I know Andy will give you a, a personal tour around the garden. Um, you know, it's, there's a lot to, there's a lot to chew on, but it's definitely something, like you said, that is incredibly rewarding, you know, from the second that you see that first, um, you know, that you see that first uh, butterfly or that first bird, you know, hummingbirds are a big thing. Um, you know, it is something that really gives you that, that sense of satisfaction that you're doing your part and you're also, um, you know, creating uh, such a unique garden for sure. Um, let's see. I think we have one more question. Are there any community gardens uh, spaces in the area? Um, Andy, maybe you would know. Um, um, I mean, I'm, assu I'm assuming uh, we're talking about um, a community garden, meaning like a, like a pea patch or something like that, if that is that kind of gardening. Um, I don't know of any in the St. Pete area. Um, unfortunately, uh, they were really popular in Seattle um, but uh, I haven't seen any. Um, the, we have, of course, um, the in terms of going to see some really great um, uh, botanical garden and garden experiences, you know, um, uh, Boyd Hill is a fantastic um, natural preserve in the heart of St. Petersburg. Um, and they have a lot of things that they do regularly um, throughout the year, like they have uh, the Raptor Fest, where they have all these um, uh, owls and eagles and hawks and things like that, and learning about uh, raptors um, and stuff like that. And then there's, of course, uh, Sunken Gardens, a uh, place where individuals can have a garden. Okay, so places where individuals can have a garden if they don't have a yard. Mm, I'm afraid I don't know. Uh, I wish I did. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that actually could be something um, that I'm sure the, uh, you know, that our local uh, uh, extension would mm -hmm. have a record of. They, they usually know, um, you know, different plots where people have the community gardens. Um, I know there's one down at Gulfport that I've been to personally. That's a really nice, really well-managed um, community garden. But, um, you know, they're all very local. Um, you know, there's a few, uh, like an Old Smar and Clearwater. Um, I've done a few programs. Um, uh, thank you for the comment on the on the native blog. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of most cities have their own kind of community garden. Um, you know, you can find you could probably find one for Dunedin. Um, I know there's one in Clearwater and Oldsmar. Um, you know, and, and and also, again, just, you know, reaching out to these resources and seeing what's available and what you can um, pursue to kind of build your knowledge. Um, uh, I will say since I got the comment on the um, on the uh, the website, our native blog, um, we do have a, a YouTube page that we're working on, um, and a lot of it is promoting the different types of native plants, um, and also maybe showing some of the examples of native yards that we've um, done. Um, I haven't yet reached out to Andy to uh, work with him on doing a uh, doing a video of the of the Chihuly planting, but I would certainly love to do that. Oh, that would be fun! I'd be happy to do that. Um, show off it. Look. It just looks wonderful in there. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, yeah, Amy, there's plenty of resources. Um, you know, it's, it, it, again, I said it a million times, but it can be kind of daunting. But if you just kind of jump in, um, you know, we've all kind of been there once, not really uh, in knowing where to start. But if you just kind of get your, uh, get your toes wet and, you know, start asking around, then, um, you know, you'll, you'll start learning, uh, you know, like no other. It'll inspire the passion, I'm sure. All right. Um, so I think uh, we're coming up on time. So um, I guess we'll call for any last uh, last questions. If anyone has anything they um, that they wanted to to say, I'll give you a few uh, give you a little bit to to type out your answers, or um, you can raise your hand um, like Dorothy did. Uh, we'd be happy to answer it uh, live if you like. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. <laughs> All right. Um, well, uh, you know, I would, I thank everyone for uh, joining us on the, uh, on the webinar. Um, hopefully you guys learned something or uh, are interested in learning something. Um, you know, there's plenty of success stories, um, you know, not only with, you know, places like the Chihuly, 
um, but plenty of um, plenty of people uh, locally in Pinellas have have started kind of jumping on the native bandwagon. Um, so there's plenty of uh, different resources to pull from, and uh, hopefully, uh, even though it's a little scary right now with everything going on, you know, hopefully you guys can still uh, find that solace in your yards or um, in uh, you know promoting the uh, the native plants and gardening. So uh, thank you. Thank you.